Welcome everybody to the ICH North Final Seminar um, that is being held here at the Kaustinen Folk Music Festival 2022. And um, I will shortly talk about our project a little bit, just the main points, and uh, then the program will continue with more of content folk music. My name is Annika Mulleri. I work as a head of music degree program at Centria University of Applied Sciences. And um, we are um, the administrator for this project, ICH North, Intangible Cultural Heritage North. Passing on our musical traditions is our subtitle. Um, this project started in January 2021 and will be finished by the end of September 22, in just a couple of months. The total budget for this project is a uh, little over 203,000 euros. And it's financed by the Interreg Nord. Uh, and uh, Tromsø and Lapinliitto as the local, Tromsø in Norway and Lapinliitto in Finland as the local financers. Um, we have been talking about uh, safeguarding intangible musical heritage, um, strengthening our network, and this is really what we have accomplished in this project. We, need, we now have a network. Um, archive cooperation we have been working on. We have also made a model um, of a musical heritage map, story map a really like a pilot project with which we will show you today and what we are still doing is writing an application uh, for planning and development of, of uh, internationally available digital education materials MOOC massive open online course and uh, other um, other cooperation archival and so on having to do with uh, music. Uh, Cynthia University has been responsible for the, the administration, project administration, reporting, <coughs> handling the finances. Uh, our Finnish partner, uh, the Folk Music Institute of Kaustinen, has been responsible for much of the content, thinking about uh, the subject matter, uh, working with the story map, getting communities together. Uh, and, and having them produce uh, content for the story map and so on. Uh, then we have partners in uh, Sweden and Norway. Sweden, Framnes Folkhögskola, and Norway, Tromsa University of... Uh, Arctic University of Norway, that's the correct name in Tromsa, yes. And then um, we have from... Um, now let's say... Uh, Sven, what, what do we... Norbotten Spelmans. yes. Spelmans mm -hmm. um, From the Swedish side at the border of Finland and Sweden. And that's uh, the people who have been working on this project. We've had monthly meetings with this project working group. Then we have also a steering group of eight people. And uh, that has met uh, twice, I think, now. And, th and third time at the end of the project. Um, and I think that's it. Also, I should mention as a expert for the Sami area, we have had Anna, uh, Anna Nakelamäki-Lensma uh, helping us with the languages and the Sami content, which is part of our project. And next, Who's in turn? Is it Lena? Our keynote speaker, Lena Marcio. Please welcome. Thank you everyone. So nice to be here with you today. I'm trying to put off my holiday hat and put on my senior advisor hat. So I work for the Finnish Heritage Agency. And I've had the pleasure of coordinating the UNESCO Convention on Intangible Cultural Heritage for more than eight years now, and I was just counting to my 
friend that this is my fourth time here at the Kaustinen festival, so been doing pretty well visiting here around every second here. So it's a pleasure always to work, come here and to work with these people and so working a lot with intangible heritage but also been assisting the Kaustinen community when applying for the UNESCO inscription of Kaustinen fiddle playing and working with several international projects. Oh, it's there, great. Okay. Uh, so today in my presentation I will tell you a bit more about what is this concept of intangible cultural heritage and though from my perspective everything that is happening in Kaustinen during this week is about intangible cultural heritage, so living heritage, especially the term ICH or intangible cultural heritage may still be unfamiliar, so even if you've been practicing it and can be really enthusiastic about it, the term might still be new one. And also the UNESCO Convention. So what is this ICH? What is the UNESCO Convention? What is safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage? What is the role of communities? What is, how are these uh, heritages transmitted into different kind of generation? And especially what's the role of music in all of this? Here in the photo I have one nice example of a living heritage. So it's actually a knitted graffiti, a neole graffiti we say in Finnish. So I think it's a nice combination of a very old tradition. So something that is knitted or made crochet, but at the same time it's a graffiti. So someone has put it somewhere in a lamp, lamp stand to say, this is my city, I own it. But instead of using paint, they're using a really old craft technique. Uh, about the convention, so all of the Nordic countries and altogether 108 state parties are actually part of this convention. So for UNESCO it's been the fastest convention, cultural convention ever. So really think that 180 countries in the world have already said that this is important. We need to safeguard living heritage. And in addition, there's a wide group of accredited NGOs. So for example, from Finland, we have the Folk Music Institute and then also Crafts Finland. From Sweden, we have maybe two NGOs accredited and from Norway, around eight or ten or something. So they have a kind of an advisory role. And for us working in the government, they are really important parts, partners. What's important is the community. So, so this convention is about the grassroots. So when we think about music or folk music, it's really the players who are in the heart of it all. Maybe traditionally it's been thought that it's some kind of master player, master folk fiddle player that is, is who knows it best, or then it can be an academic researcher. But in our convention, all are equally important. So it can be a five-year-old person who just started to work on the Napperi method, or it can be some senior who just started it, got retired and started dancing or, or playing or singing. They are all important in this convention. But it's a sister to the World Heritage Convention, which is the, the more famous sister, one might say, with the over 1,000 World Heritage sites. So we benefit quite much of that visibility, that something besides world heritage. But within our convention, it's then not the buildings or the concrete things, but the intangible ones, but I'll get there soon. It has a lot of purposes, but the main thing is to safeguard these living traditions, to pass them on and to make sure that they live in 50 or 100 years, that we still know how to build up a uh, cantele or we still know how to play one of those uh, fiddles whatever they might be called so that these are passed on so it's this vitality of the tradition that we speak about it's an in interesting question then what can a government do and what do the communities do so but if you think of what these kind of centers or museums or archives or schools what they are doing, how they are funded. Government does have an important role to play. A bit about the definition. So this was drafted with tens of countries from different corners of the continents and they ended up with this kind of a result. So it's practices, representation, expressions, knowledge and skills. 
they are related to many kind of material things. So if you want to play the fiddle, you have to have it. I mean, playing the air guitar is fun, of course, but to make a nice sound of it, you need the actual thing around it as well. That communities, groups or individuals recognize that this is heritage. We might even have the tradition that the saying that this is a tradition, we do this often. It goes on from generation to generation, but it doesn't actually have an age limit, or at least we don't. Actually, our colleagues in China say that it needs to be at least 100 years old, but I'm really glad that we don't have that kind of restriction. If, if the people think that this is heritage, this is important, it's passed on, then it is that. So we can really include different kind of traditions that have different ages, so they can be born 100, 200 years ago or maybe 10 years ago, so it doesn't, that's, that's not the most important thing. They are recreated, so this is not your thing where you, where you put, the, put the flute on the vitrine and you say, no, 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 this is the only way to do it or this is the only right way to play it, but the idea is that they are recreated. Also brings in a sense of identity. Here I put the, I mean, the, the concept, so we actually speak of elava perin, the living heritage, rather than intangible cultural heritage, aineet on kulttuuri perin, it's a very long, confusing word, and also our colleagues in, in Sweden speak about levan, the traditioner, and so on. Even in UNESCO, they speak of themselves as the living, as the living heritage entity. So, but what is included? Uh, for example, these kind of, of different um, domains, we have our, in our Finnish wiki inventory. So it's about music and dance and performing arts. So really what is, has now been done in the ICH North project, that is really the hardcore of living heritage. And I think if you go and stop anyone from the streets, obviously in Kaustinen, but anywhere in, in Finland and in the world, someone would say, yes, it's singing or... Yes, yes, it's playing something, that's action, that's living heritage. Festivities and practices, oral traditions, crafts, food traditions, games and playing, nature and the universe, and also different kind of food safeguarding practices. But what is combining all of these? They are something that are passed on from generation to generation. They bring you a sense of belonging or a sense of community. And they are also something that the communities themselves want to pass on. But within this convention, it's, it's an important tool for states. We have agreed together with 180 other states. Our parliament has said we're going to ratify this, we're going to do this. We're going to do the inventory, we're going to work on our legal, administrative, financial measures. We're going to raise awareness, encourage communities and support them so that they benefit from, from this safeguarding. Uh, in Finland we've been working it with, since 2013. Um, my organization Musei Verket, Museo Virasto, works as the coordinator. Uh, for us the awareness raising is about seminars, webinars, having a YouTube channel, Facebook, site, educational website, and at the moment we are also working with an international project on LIVID, creative and living cultural heritage as a resource for the northern dimension, so Nordic, Baltic countries and Poland included. But I'll get, come back to the sustainability question right in the end of my presentation. One of the obligatory things in this convention is to make inventories. And these inventories are usually nowadays uh, websites where we make living heritage visible. So for example, in our case, it's called the Wiki Inventory for Living Heritage, Elävänperinnön Wikiluettelo. And there we have uh, 210 examples now from over 250 communities. So it's a bit like Wikipedia but it's concentrating on intangible cultural heritage and it's not one person behind the articles but always a community. So for example when we first put the Kaustin and fiddle playing in it was then maybe four or five different organizations from, from here who then sort of wrote it and made a good process with it to discuss with it among different stakeholders and then be also the ones who are sort of signing under. 
We also have a national inventory, so one can apply every second year with more questions and then the Ministry of <coughs> Education and Culture putting a stamp on it. Uh, in addition, it's possible to apply to the UNESCO lists. So I'll tell about them maybe in my next slide, but for example from Finland it's sauna culture, uh, it's cowspin and fiddle playing, and then it's the Nordic clinkable tradition. So the traditional boats that we have on our shores that are not like this, but are the clinking thing is like that. So, And that's the first uh, pan-Nordic nomination. So these boats have been built 800 years along the coastlines, but only fif around 50 people in Finland build them as professionals nowadays. Yes, so if you are not familiar with it yet, please do have a look. Also, a lot of material available in English and in Swedish. Some examples of folk music and dance, maybe Matti could tick the box here and say how many of them are can be heard or seen here at the Kaustinen Festival during this week, but I'm actually sure that quite many are, so there will be folk dance in Swedish, Finnish, Finland, Kaustinen fiddling of course, open air dancing maybe somewhere at the festival site, Menuet, then Menuet is also the, the theme of this year for the Center for help me here. Yes, Center for Folk Music and Folk Dance. I'm sure Jouhikko, Jouhi Kantele will be heard and Kantele was just heard outside playing the musical saw. And actually that article got born in one of, it's not, it was not in Kausinen, but it's some other festival where we had a living heritage clinic and we were discussing that, what is it about? And finally it got here. But also traditions, this rehearsal is not just about traditional Finnish culture, but rather it's about intangible cultural heritage inside the borders of our country. So all kind of minorities are included, old and new ones. And with the ICH North project, it's been a pleasure to see that the Sami people play such a, such a central role in it and they are included and also in the future steps. I think it's really important that, that different kind of minorities, which are many inside our countries, that they are also included. So I think these processes that we work for, they are also important tools in opening up people's minds that what is this heritage actually about. We work a lot with, with different kind of communities on the ground. For us it's the circles of living heritage. So for example, here was established, was it like seven years ago, maybe the circle for folk music and folk dance. So the way how I think what's, what can this kind of a convention or anyhow, why do we need to use such a term such as living heritage or intangible cultural heritage? And I think the key thing is that we don't always just stay among our own people, among the, the ones who play the same instrument or the folk music fans or to lock ourselves into certain groups, but to see it a bit more broadly. And I think I've been, I've been seeing a lot of success stories when people come together and when a folk musician and someone from the circus and someone doing the traditional fishing that they actually have quite much in common. And if they start to talk about safeguarding of traditions or transmitting or how to get the young people involved or how to get the projects running, they share many things in common. Uh, this is maybe the sexiest part of our convention, at least when it comes to the media. So if you put UNESCO and something together and or UNESCO list something that's the thing that catches the, the attention of the media that have we seen and especially when you put then also sauna after it so some good keywords to google but i mean it, it is an important part there are already over 600 elements on these lists so i think in that sense it's interesting that it, it makes it understandable that what is this now and right away if you start to talk about Kaustin and fiddle playing human towers in Spain, whistling language in Norway, boat or in Turkey, boat building in Norway or sauna in Finland, you're like, 
ah, this is what it is about. So you see, it's actually such examples that we know or we have run into when we travel to different countries. They are often the things that I saw when I have the pizza there or I saw when I do the acupuncture in China or oh, I love the French meal and so on. But this is not only a rehearsal to, uh, to, to take the most famous things, but this is to bring visibility to different kind of heritages. And I think also this is one, one important role for the ICH North project, that it's not only the sauna that gets the attention, but different kind of heritages in our countries. Uh, there's a lot of... Uh, examples on the UNESCO lists. Uh, I took some of the examples here. Uh, Congolese rumba, Inuit drum dancing and singing. That was now the first element from Denmark slash Greenland that ever came there. Uh, multi Visoko multi-part singing from Bulgaria, Irish harping. There's a photo. Morna of Capo Verde. Art of crafting and playing Mbira or Sansi in Malawi and Zimbabwe. So also in many cases, so as it is actually also in the Kaustin and fiddle playing. So though the name is the fiddle playing, it's also related practices. So what else do you need or what else happens in the community that play the fiddle? So for example, someone needs to build the fiddles. Or it's also about singing together with the music or dancing to the music or also dressing up on the, on the national costumes or some kind of traditional clothes. Music and dance of Dominican Bachata, tango in Ar Argentina and reggae from Jamaica. So also the concept of the folk music or traditional music uh, actually it's only music and dance. Uh, the, the name of the domain that we have under UNESCO. So they can come close to rock music or pop music in different senses. In our national, it's not in the national, but on the wiki inventory, we have metal music, for example, which is highly popular in Finland. And that's intangible heritage for many people, but we tend to think that there needs to be these certain kind of instruments and they need to be wearing certain kind of clothes and it needs to be from inside from our country. So it's also good to note that it's, it's different kind of, they can be various kind. And it's not actually me as someone working for the government and it's not UNESCO to say is this traditional enough or old enough or this or that enough, but it is about the community. So who wants to be involved in a process enough to do the long year, many year thing that you actually did here in Kaustinen with your fiddle play. Is it your thing? Will you get something out of it? Is it useful for you? So, there can be many kinds of traditions. Uh, till the end of my presentation, I just want to highlight some of the concepts which I think are also important for the, for the ICH North project. So, one of them being this concept of safeguarding. So, the name of our convention is it has the name in it, so it's not protection or preservation. Suojeleminen is the Finnish translation, which is not the best one, I think, rather vaaliminen or turvaaminen. But it is about ensuring the viability, as I already told in the beginning. And that can be done in various ways. How, how do we make sure that some of those instruments, that there, there is still makers, for payupilli, whatever that might be in some in, in English language. So some traditional, I think the community who builds these, they, they are small. So for example, where we need efforts is that we get new, new people, new young people learning to do this. Threats are different kind. In many occasions it is that now the young people are not interested. They rather do this thing mm. on their free time. But to how to get them excited? What does it mean? What, what kind of courses do we need to have? Or what's going to need to happen in school? Or do we need to have more pop stars, including Jouhikko or, or Munni Harfu in their performances? And, and, and these are the threats that we need to think about and then to see that how can we solve these problems? So it's actually a step-by-step -step 
process how we can go there. And it's a big group of people that needs to participate when you're thinking how can we safeguard it. So the group, the community concept is really important in our work many ways. But for example, here in Kaustinen, the core of it is maybe the, oh, it's actually the next one. So the core, who, who are they? So the core people are the fiddlers, those who actually play the fiddle. But then there can be people who participate, for example, uh, it, for example, the parents that take their kids to the Napparit course or, or are somehow included in the work of, of this, this institute. And in the general public, for example, all the people who come to the Kaustinen festival. So it's actually quite a big number of people who participate in the process of safeguarding it and transmitting it further. Um, communities in, are in the center, so as much as I love my work and already after eight years start to know just a bit about some of the hundreds of things that are out there, it's always the people who practice them. They are the best experts and they know most about it and when it comes to the work of intangible heritage, it's them that you need to listen to. It's important that, that the, the living heritage that they that they re that it retains its significance so it really has to have a meaning in their life and the truth also is that not all kind of heritage lives on they come and they go and it's a natural flow of things balance between economic social and environmental development peace and security even in safeguarding efforts and in i wanted to end this presentation to the Agenda 2030, so sustainable development that has been close to my heart now for the last year. So sort of, I felt it, I have such a passion for this field. I think living heritage or intangible heritage is in, in the center of what we are and who we are. Me, for as a, well, as a person, as a woman, as a mother, if I think what's around me, it is the values that I transmit to my kids. It's the way we spend our summer holidays at the cottage or how we pass on the traditions on Christmas or what kind of songs have I been singing to them as kids. But then it has this wider societal meaning. So I'm sometimes a bit annoyed that it's like from a, uh, from an administrative perspective or sometimes even political, it's like here's culture, where well, here's the world, here is culture, here it's heritage and this intangible thing is there in the corner of it all. But how I like to think that if, if intangible heritage is such a big part of what we are, how we do, how we, how we are in the world and how we consume, how we use our free time, they can actually even have key answers of how we're gonna survive, how we're gonna live on, how we're gonna plan a sustainable future. And this beautiful picture is from the UNESCO website, it's called Dive into ICH. And all these dots are those 600 elements on the UNESCO lists. And you see the Agenda 2030, so the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. You see that each and every of them are connected to something. So it can be sustainable food production, sustainable cities, quality education, clean water or various things. So with this, my last slide, I want to say that intangible heritage is in the core of development and we should be proud of it. We should say it out loud and to say that also our project here, it has a strong societal meaning and that's why it should go on into the bright future. Thank you for your attention. Matti still wants to add something. You're free to do so if I forgot to say something. No, thank You're you. good with it all. Thank <laughs> you very much, Lena. That was very uh, important and uh, very, very nice, ni nicely put. Um, Lauri, maybe next we will hear about the map. <laughs> Come on, 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 come on,
Okay, so hello camera, I'm Lauri Oeno, development manager for the Pop Music Institute. And uh, I'll present, the, I think, the, the concrete outcome of this uh, project that we have for now. I think we have aimed for two outcomes. One would be this uh, ICH map, musical heritage map of the project region and the other was the uh, next project. Uh, so um, <coughs> uh, we decided in quite an early phase what this map, map would present and uh, what it would include. So uh, it would present uh, the uh, musical heritage of the, <coughs> of the region so that uh, the one crucial decision was that we don't uh, present musical traditions but we present music uh, communities that uh, uphold these traditions to avoid uh, a difficult uh, uh, ponderings on the limits of musical traditions and what is this and what, what is that tradition and also to stick to the spirit of the UNESCO convention uh, uh, so that we start, start from the communities. Well, how this uh, aim was fulfilled, I'm not quite sure if, if it was so strictly fulfilled because at least me during the process I noticed that uh, we have to be quite pragmatic about what the communities produce. Um, <coughs> uh, we decided that uh, Every community and their musical heritage is uh, presented uh, uh, first of all, all the, the her heritage of the, uh, of the region is presented with a map showing the communities or traditions of the region. And then every uh, musical community is presented uh, with a music sample, sound sample, with a short video telling uh, how we transmit our heritage to next generation, generations. Then a brief uh, uh, text uh, describing the heritage and a photo and also something else. Well, we'll see an example. And the basic idea was that all this is done <coughs> by the communities themselves and it, that's why it's supposed to be easy. So uh, there will be two minutes video which can be made on mobile phone or whatever the Basically, the only technical instruction was that uh, uh, that try to try to make sure that the voice is decent and don't put the person talking in, into shadow. Uh, and uh, and then the, the the text describing it was uh, supposed to be quite short and uh, so on, so that. No, no technical uh, requirements would, would prevent anything. But still I think uh, it was maybe a bit chale challenging for many communities. And uh, <coughs> I was in charge of um, trying to uh, get uh, Finnish, Finnish musical communities involved. And we, we sent a call to uh, known actors in folk music, in uh, associations and uh, 
active persons and so on on the region and we got some but uh, there are still many communities that could produce their, their part here and hopefully now that, now that we have this to show I hope in the next project uh, they see that that uh, first of all that this is something that is worth joining in and second that it's it's not so difficult but anyway we got uh, nine examples I think uh, uh, of the uh, communities or traditions on this map and uh, uh, oh what's happened now sorry I can't use the uh, this with looking backwards. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I lost the sense of directions. Okay, so um, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, now um, maybe I should talk a little <laughs> in this space that about the technical uh, uh, issues. This was a bit of a learning process uh, of communication between us uh, humanists with our dreams of how things will show and then the uh, limitations of the technical platform and the vocabulary of the technical team and, and us. So uh, this there, there was like a, um, how would I say, well we imagined that this and this and this would be possible and then it came out that actually it's not possible with this platform. Also one thing we maybe didn't uh, think so much about which we learned that uh, is, is the la la language issues because we have uh, I think uh, fin Finnish, Swedish, uh, Norwegian and uh, at least four Sami dialects and uh, uh, the translating the texts was a bit slower and maybe cost costlier than we thought and putting the subtitles in the videos and so on so, but so these things need resources both in time and, and money and then uh, the final result was that uh, we have this, uh, this page, page uh, this uh, uh, as two language versions, one is uh, English and one is the original language, with, which means that the uh, texts and video subtitles titles are in original language. But even in that page, uh, the general general text is in English because we hadn't hadn't. Uh, the possibility to make like seven completely different language versions and I, I think that was something we hadn't thought about in the beginning but uh, I think this still is working decently so um, I think we might start uh, see one example and I think this is the most recent example I swear. And uh, yes, we so we had uh, nine nine examples, and uh, then we had a uh, uh, from Swedish side also from a dance uh, video school. We had uh, materials from students, but uh, they would have needed more editing to become suit suitable suitable for this. So maybe this can be used in the next project and then also from Norway we, we have some in, input uh, in so late for uh, various reasons uh, in so late phase that uh, they couldn't be uh, we had no time to add them uh, before this seminar so we have a bit more of, of this input already and hopefully we can use that in the next project but now when we go go here to 
so okay, maybe it's right somewhere here or in the flag. I thought this is <laughs> complete already. Actually, we <laughs> must go this route, okay? There's so what now. Okay, so uh, first we have a musical sound. <laughs> Sven, what was this called? We it's a Polka, it's a Polka in Swedish and in English and in our, our um, language, Merki, Meton Polka. Okay. Okay, then when we scroll down, uh, there you can see in the big, big map, map when we hit this uh, red thing, it get, came closer and then it uh, enlarge it or make it smaller to see see the, the like the geographical map spot with numbers but then there's uh, another map here uh, and this is uh, this is now the community view of the region uh, of this community's musical heritage. So uh, I asked Sven that uh, please draw me a map that shows about what's your uh, your heritage region and uh, and I left it to, to the community representatives to uh, to define uh, how they think about this region whether it's the like the hi historical region or the musical tradition or whether it's the uh, region where the current participant participants of uh, of uh, practicing it come from so uh, I think it would have been uh, somehow wrong to give more uh, sharper advices or restriction, re restrictions as, as to how to define what is the region. So <laughs> both, the, bo both the region and the criteria is community produced. Uh, and then there's this, okay, this is now the original and language version C, if we can find it. Oh, okay. Sorry. I must practice this <laughs> scrolling thing. That's okay. Uh, I must scroll the whole way down to selection I think. Where is it? Ah, oh, there. So as you can see this uh, like usability is not yet World Championship level, but we don't need to have it. Have World Championship. Level. So yes, then there's this uh, small text uh, describing <coughs> describing the uh, the element in question, basically. And then a photo, and then it's the video 
our uh, community representative or, or a couple of them tell about the activities to uh, safeguard and keep the tradition viable and we could now see at least part of Sedan 2013 har vi haft spelarnas kurser och spelarnas evenemang i byn Korpukulä. Kurserna håller vi nu med på Sågården sedan 2019. Jag kan bara berätta i mig att vi hade gäster från Kaosvinen då, Malmö Järnberga och Hundom från Kaosvinen som var här på besök. Och våra spelledare då var Tore Hedelin, Kjellsson Spelman, äh, Kjellmans laget och dottern Tuva Hedelin. Men äh, hur läns låtarna är ju inte något speciellt nytt sätt att lära oss. Det har väl alltid gjort att man härmar någon som spelar för det. Och så gör vi i Folkhuga också att spelledaren börjar på låten och läns kanske få takter och vi är man tills vi kan de två takterna och spelar om och om igen tills den sitter. Och så går vi vidare takt för takt tills vi lär oss hela låten. Och sen spelar vi tillsammans hela gruppen om och om igen tills vi kan hela låten. Och äh, märker jag det inte. Men är det så att vi råkar vara på olika nivåer i spelskicklighet Kanske några behöver lite mer tid på sig. Så då kan man ju nivågruppera i olika grupper och så får man spela i sin egen takt tills man lär sig låten. Och äh, spelledarna hjälper ju till och slussar oss hela vägen tills vi kan alla toner i låt. Och äh, så gör man med alla låtar så många man hinner under. Det är på slutet. Vi startar på fredag bara och slutar på söndag. Och då när vi har den färdiga med kursen, då när vi har ett paket låtar med oss in på gehör. Men vi ger också chansen att spela in låtarna med hjälp av dagens teknik, digital teknik, telefonerna. Eller så delar vi ut låtar till de som vi har fått. Och på så sätt jobbar vi här på Sågården. Och jag önskar alla hjärtligt välkomna hit till kursen. I regel så har vi våra kurser i juli månad. Okej. Okay. Här är det här på Sågården. Så, so, uh, basically, that's how this... Uh, oh, That's how this uh, map is uh, structured, and uh, there's sh surely s uh, a lot of technical improvements to make. But uh, I think this already does pretty, not pretty nicely what this it's made for. And uh, actually, we we had a already a little international reputation with this because. Uh, Uh, just only this week, I think, uh, a scholar from uh, Germany uh, sent me an email and uh, she had uh, learned about our project in, uh, in some uh, century of 
school uh, uh, on a web page, web page uh, where this is only like I know our project that even doesn't have on web web pages, but it, it was on central page page and she asked uh, uh, her question was that uh, does this project involve uh, also uh, song tradition or is it only play tradition and, uh, and I answered that uh, because she, she was do, doing her uh, research on uh, singing traditions and I, <coughs> I answered that uh, uh, that yes we this involves all mu musical heritage whether it's, it's sung or played and actually all the Sami examples here, they are entirely sung music, as we very well know. And then I sent a, sent a link to this map and uh, asked her to look, that, look, at, it, look at it. And uh, she uh, answered, and uh, her an answer was like very applauding to us. And she thought that this is really something. Uh, valuable and good, so maybe we have a good path <laughs> with us with this. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Laura, uh, Lauri and uh, Sarah. Next, we will uh, hear about the future. <coughs> sure, yes. department and I've been taking care of, of the administration part in this project, so reports and, and all the so-called boring stuff. Mm. And I've also been working on uh, the application for a main project. Because this project, funded by Interreg Nord, Nord, has been a preparatory project and one of the goals was to prepare an application from Interreg Aurora and I'm going to talk a bit of that now. Interreg Aurora is a new program and Interreg Nord is uh, ending when this program is, when this project is ending, so that's the last day of September. Also Interreg Botnia Atlantica and both Botnia Atlantica and North has been um, different areas with, different, uh, with a different program, different funding. But now Interreg Aurora, that starts now, is uh, composed of both areas for Atlantica, Botnia Atlantica and Interreg North. So it's a really big area. And we're heading for an application, the first call, with a deadline of the last day of August. Uh, there will be a second call in February, March, so if we, for some reason, can't, if we have a bump in the road and can't leave the application now, we have a second possibility. And uh, then there will probably would be two or three calls every year. But there are different priority areas. And now in the first call and in the second call, uh, the call is open for all the different priorities. But in the future, they might have a call for just some of the priorities. And the project duration for the coming project would be from the first day of February 23, and it would last till the end of. 2025, so it's quite far in the future. Uh, and it's the maximum project time in, in, in Aurora. And it would be a regular project. In, uh, there are also small projects. And there are two sub areas in Aurora, Aurora and Sapmi. And we're heading there for an application in Aurora sub area. And it's the priority number three, a more social Europe, education, culture and sustainable tourism with a specific objective, culture and sustainable tourism. Uh, but it doesn't have to include sustainable tourism. It could be culture or sustainable tourism. 
And this is the Aurora area. And as you can see, it's quite big. It's really, really large. And I think it's one of the biggest interreg areas in, in European Union. And uh, the blue area is sub area submit. And the one with uh, the other one, as you can see, that's Aurora. And in Sweden, it can includes Norrbotten, Westerbotten, and Western Norrland, so three different regions. In Finland, it's Lappi, Pohjois, Pohjanmaa, Keski, Pohjanmaa, Pohjanmaa, and Etelä, Pohjanmaa. It feels like it's half of Finland, almost. <coughs> and in Norway, it's Trans, Finnmark, or Nordland. And the project partners, since the Aurora area is bigger, it has been possible to bring more partners into the project. And as it looks now, uh, one month before the deadline, we have the following partners with a budget. In Finland, it's Centria and Novia un universities of applied science, the Finnish Folk Music Institute, and Kultur Österbotten, which is a part of, of uh, Sofik. It's like lots of munis municipalities. In Sweden, it's Westernmorlands Museum and Kultur and Swedenings Verksamhet partners with a budget and in Norway we're hoping for the University of Trump, so the Arctic University of Norway. Associated partners is for example in Sweden, Studio for Bundet Bilda Nord, Riksförbundet for Folkmusik of Dance, Sveriges Film and Riksförbund. An associated partner isn't part of the project with a budget, but they have signed a letter of intent and they could be part of the, all the actions in the program, in the project. And this is a lot of text. This is the overall aim of the project. Pretty much the same as in the preparatory uh, project. But the project will support the safeguarding of the musical heritage and promote cross-border cooperation related to the cultural heritage of music, enhance the role of musical communities in the area, building bridges between educational institutions and heritage communities. And it's community-based, bottom-up approach with the, with the UNESCO Convention. And then a little bit about the work packages, the actions within the project. And uh, Interreg uh, would like uh, to have one responsible partner for each work package, but they also want the work packages to be knit together so that the uh, results uh, are supporting each other and there are synergy effects and that uh, the partners from different countries are working together cross border. Uh, first, we have the first work package, the MOOC, a massive open online course. And it's Centria and, and the University of Tromsø that would be responsible for it. And it's based on the planning done in the preparatory project. It would be produced, implemented, and ev evaluated. And some of the videos used in the digital map could also be used in the massive open online course. And I will talk a little bit more about the MOOC later on. And then the digital map. So based on the pilot version that we just saw, uh, we could continue and, and build on the lessons learned, do a bigger one, perhaps a different digital platforms and include more communities from a bigger area. Uh, and then it's the work package number three, the educational material on ICH for non formal education uh, and the target group would be adults in musical communities, adults with a leader role, for example, uh, in a Spielmann's Lab, uh, music organizations, civil organizations, study circles that are really important in Sweden, I understood. And perhaps the material also could be used for transmission within families. So it would be a wide target group. And the actions include educational material, and it would also be network meetings, webinars, and also a pilot group, a community where you could, that could be used for testing actions taken to increase social inclusion. That's the thought. And it's Kultur Österbotten and Kulturen that would be responsible for the third work package, working together. And the digital map would be the Finnish Folk Music Institute and the Western Norlands Museum would also be interested to join in. And then we have 
Work package number four, which would be under the responsibility of Lovia, uh, University of Applied Sciences, and it deals with musical heritage, entrepreneurship, and cultural tourism with the aim to build a community network at think tanks and also tandem meetings with, with musicians and rep representatives from communities and entrepreneurs with the hope of having some innovations and things that could be used in cultural tourism. And then the, the last one, the last work package, number five, that's a joint strategy for safeguarding musical heritage for archives in the Aurora area and that also includes a roadmap ahead, so uh, how to continue when the project ends. So that's basically the content. And then a little bit about uh, Nassib Open Online Course. It's massive, there's an unlimited number of participants, it's open for all. Uh, sometimes, well, you have to register, but it's, it's, it's not a fee. Sometimes it might be for a, a limited time, for example, a couple of years. It's online, only online, digital platform. And it's a course, it's just, it's not a collection of material, but it's a, it's a course. The platform could be a commercial one or just an own one. It could be any website, as long as it's massive open online and it's a course. Uh, it's good to have the compulsory information with credits like who had made a material, accessibility statement, and a contact person. So if, if you're a student, you know, you have somebody to contact if you have a question. Uh, and also license, for example, Creative Commons. Uh, the administration might be through the Open University or Open Studies, because uh, if, you, if you take a MOOC, you can just see parts of the material and for just your own interest but or if you want to you can get formal credits but then it has to go through the administration of a, of a school or an educational institution and the MOOC of this project uh, the target group would be music students practitioners members of communities in the uh, Aurora area, but it could also be a global target group, so anybody in the world that is interested. And the material will be open, open source. Um, and the digital learning environment would make it easier for learners across the area, because the Aurora area is so big, but it, because it's digital, it, anybody in the area could easily join. And those that complete the course might get institutional credits if they wish so, but you can just take part of the course and watch the material. And that's basically it. Do you have any questions? I just included a little bit of information on the coming project. But I've been sitting the last few weeks writing the text, application text, so I know it by heart almost. So if you have any questions, please. Let me know. Otherwise, we'll just cross our fingers, and if we get uh, uh, funding from Aurora, then we have many years to work on the subject. I think. Uh, could you tell a little bit about the how the budget will be divided, or how what is acceptable by the by the financer? How can we do it? Yes, there are, uh, there are two uh, kinds of budget model, models in, in Interreg Aurora. The first one is uh, personal costs, like salaries, including the fees for, uh, for employers, and then a 40% flat rate above that, on top of that, which covers all the costs for, for office or if we have a meeting or if there has to be something bought, like for example, experts help on, on a digital platform. And the other budget version is where you have like a normal budget where you uh, calculate salaries and then you have to know the cost in beforehand, like how much you need for traveling or how much you need for, for external expertise. And we, we um, concluded that the 40% flat rate model would be, would be a good one. And then each partner that are in this with a budget, they, they calculate how much personnel 
cost they have for a three year period. So like, for example, 25% of this one person for three years. And, and that's the salary, including the fees for the employer. And then the flat rate is the cost. And we have a little bit of, of, of different amounts of partners from each of the different countries. And we thought this would be a problem, but I actually asked the Aurora Secretariat and they said it's okay as long as the results will be available and visible in the whole area, it's okay that we have more partners from Finland than from Sweden, for example, and the budget doesn't have to be like even between the different three different countries. And that's good for us because uh, we have slightly more partners from Finland. But then we have more associated partners from Sweden. And the, the budget is the thing we have to do still in August before the deadline. So if we get the budget together, we can put this in. This exactly. Application. Yes, exactly. So you're happy with the application? It's a, there's no big uh, kind of uh, standard rating or is I it think ready? It's ready to it's, I think yes. it's kind of ready. On Tuesday this week, I sent the final version yes. to all the partners based on the comments. We are all it. reading it and commenting. <laughs> That's on your vacation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, but we're, I'm waiting for the final, for the final uh, comments and input. Mm. And if we have that by mid-August, together with the staff cost that you need for, for your, for your organization, I think we're done. And then uh, the Interreg Aurora is funding 65 percent of the budget in Finland and Sweden, 50 percent in Norway because you're not part of the mm. EU. And then the national funding is a bit different between the different countries. In Finland, we have Lappinliitto, who is financing around 25%, which leaves 10% uh, to the organizations. In Norway, it's the region in, in Troms, who is funding around 20%, which leaves you with a slightly bigger uh, percentage. And then in Sweden, it's, it's, not, um, it's not a specific authority that is funding the national part, but we have to look for different from different places, and we have a plan to to apply from uh, Region Western Orland, and perhaps have a Sandskolen because we have Western Orlands Museum, and with them are also Hannesand Folkhögskola School and Hannesand Folk Music Club, so we have like Hannesand <laughs> part, and then also the Nordic uh, cultural funds like a Nordic Kultur Fund. So we hope to apply from those three to get the Swedish national part. So there are some questions open, but I think on the whole, and when you look at, at all the other projects that are, are applying, we have a fair chance, I think. And also the, the actions are, are fitting really nicely into the program strategy that they have. And of course our steering group, it, it's great if they have time to, to read the application content-wise mm. and comment. Yes. Can we still change the, we were thinking about like who's doing the work packages, can mm. we still think over like that? Of like course. That yeah. mm -hmm. And then do you have a estimation of the final budget or you do not No, because it depends on, on when I get the numbers from you. And, and so far I've only got the numbers from Western Orlands and Museum. And when we have all the parts, we know the total budget, and we have when we have the bu budget from Sweden, we know how much the national. And also for the application, uh, I, we have to put in, we have to divide the budget between the different work packages. But it's fairly easy to do because it's like it's the salary and the flat rate, and then the administration and communication parts, which is. Uh, Centrias part has to be divided between the different work packages and it's from Aurora a, a way of them to try to get us to think about that is this realistic the thing the money you use to do the actions mm -hmm. so it's more for for them to kind of point out hey like do you really need this much money to do this that is it in relation mm -hmm. to the output but and, and do you have the Centria budget already? No. no. It's only Western Orlands Museum, but it's fairly easy to, to calculate if you know like uh, uh, how much time a 
person could put in, and it could be two persons from an organization. For example, Western Olas Museum have three persons, like it's one, one working 50% for three years, and then another one working slightly less months with 25%. So it could be, it could be different. And it could be less from, from somebody, it could be only 20% from one partner and more from somebody else. And Centria has to take the, the administration and the communication part and then one work package, so we have to calculate that. So by in, in August, the deadline is the 31st, but it would be good to get the numbers bit before that. <laughs> yes, yes. But I think the text for the application is pretty much when, I, when you just have read it and commented. That's pretty much. And if there is something, something, force mayor or something, we still have this second fall in February, March. Mm -hmm. okay. There's always, always the associate partner, as, as long as you know, some, some, I mean, he wants to be involved, but doesn't have the budget that mm -hmm. they can. Of course. We have to remember that. Um, yeah. And the only attachment that we actually need for the application is form that the person signing for Centria's part has the right to sign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the letter of intent is good to have yeah. still because we can we can show the interest. Yes. Yeah. So. Excellent. Do we have questions about this? Did you get any ideas <laughs> about this? <laughs> it's wonderful. It's a great project. I'm so happy about it and I can't wait for us to get a chance to promote it further to the rest of the world. I'm sure there will be we, we work also with the other 179 countries, so I think it's really fantastic work you've been doing with this project already, and it's, I'm so having my thumbs up and strong trust in that there will be more funding to it. It's a great experience, and it can also teach a lot for other countries and other regions how to work, work with music and with living heritage. So, good work. How did it look to you all? Research yeah. <laughs> Very good. This was first time for me. Yes, so. Yes, yeah. Yes. I think it's very true what Lena said that it's like uh, when we go to the convention meetings and uh, they are from all around the world, different areas, they, they work with ICH, they work with the same party. They are very, very interested. If, if somebody has done something like a project or a map or something to because you can really easily copy it to their own country. So I'm sure that like, when we proceed here, it, it's, uh, it will be very, like, uh, it raises a lot of interest in, in other areas, not only in this area. Mm -hmm. And we do need to work with such kind of websites and such kind of context, content that is easy for people. So for example, this really nice video of what, what you have made, this is what people want. So even though we would want to every time write a tender picture about everything, it needs to be something like this. And I already think that when you sort of have a small glimpse of something, then you get more interested. Mm -hmm. And it's really nice. I've seen some of the videos, so it's good work. And it doesn't need to be more complicated than that, but also allowing you to explain how it needs to be easy access and easy to use and easy both for, for the user but also for the one who is making the content. So I, our experience is since 2016 with the, with the wiki inventory, but I also know that it needs a lot of work to get people excited so it's not enough to open a fancy website and say, hey, you are welcome. So I know I've been working a lot with the communities, but it's nice, I mean, then when you get the flow of people coming in and also from different countries, because I believe that in this area that we work in, there's a lot of possibilities to exchange across borders and be inspired. It's a very good point. Sorry, I have a technical questions. question. Uh, will we have this panel discussion that is on the program, or will we change it like this? I think we can have a discussion on yeah. that, yeah. because we are just a panel. And I think it's all pointless to continue. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you.